for 14 seconds. A woman is diagnosed with breast cancer. Let that sink in for a moment. That could be someone's mother, someone's sister, someone's daughter. And in many parts of the world, the cancer has rooted itself way too deeply, not just in the body, but in its surrounding as well. So that led us to ponder. Perhaps a few lines of code could save her life. Here are the scans of patient X, a 44-year-old woman with two tumors in her breasts. There's a phyllodes tumor on her right breast and a cyst on her left breast. Every decision that the doctor makes from this point forward is crucial to the future of patient X. He needs to make sure that the tumor doesn't spread, which would cause her to die, that he doesn't put too much surgical or procedural pressure on her, which could cause her to die, and he should do everything in his power to make sure that she doesn't have to compromise her breasts. So what should we do now? Well, actually, breast cancer is one of the most curable cancers if it is detected early. However, current traditional diagnostic can be sometimes long, expensive, and even subjective. Current pathologists, though being highly trained, can still have disagreements over what they see under a microscope. Which led to the birth of our project of utilizing machine learning in the analysis of cell morphology to diagnose breast cancer. In simpler terms, we are training artificial intelligence to look at a series of breast cells and come to a prediction on whether it's benign or malignant. Now, let me take you into the world of a single breast cell. In generally in healthy cells, the cells appear rather regular and healthy in general. However, when cancer starts to take place, the tightly regulated process tends to be disrupted. The cells become irregular, they are more elongated as usual, and they have to, a nucleus that, is, that swells incredibly larger than usual. And this is something that we can notice from a picture standpoint. And the cells and nucleus will swell to an extent due to excess DNA activity. So one of the most widely used procedures to test for breast cancer is called the fine needle aspiration. So as its name suggests, it involves inserting a gentle a fine needle into the breast or suspicious lung and the sample is then given to a pathologist to be inspected. This process is relatively painless and does not require any anesthesia or surgery. But the tricky part comes when the pathologists have to examine it under a microscope. While we do not deny that they are highly trained, these judgments are heavily based on human interpretation. And this interpretation is subjected to things like fatigue, variability and even error which is why our project is able to give a form of prediction in an easier way. Fine needle aspiration is, provides the raw biological data, whereas our machine learning model gives its predictive power. Instead of the pathology saying, hmm, this nucleus looks kind of odd, the machine learning model gives a specific statement where the radius is 7.5, the area is 920, and the texture score is high, indicating a malignant cell. One key feature of our machine learning model involves cell morphology, and the four main that we'll talk, talk upon today is radius, area, texture, and parameter. Radius, for instance, refers to the length between the center of the nucleus to the edge. And in cancerous cells, the radius of the cell, since it's swelling, would be quite uneven. Parameter refers to the total boundary of the nucleus, and in cancerous cells, the, the nucleus will lose its symmetry having an irregular parameter. The texture, which refers to how smooth and grainy the nucleus is, and due to the excess DNA activity and cell replication in the cell, the cancerous cell tend to be very uneven and grainy. Lastly, area. Cancerous cells have a huge area than normal cells, which is one of the most consistent red flags in pathology. The data set that we use to train the model is called the Wisconsin Breast Cancer Data Set. It involves 569 samples across 30 key features and 10 cell attributes. It was created by Dr. William Wahlberg back in the 1980s, together with a group of computer science researchers. What Dr. Wahlberg did was basically he gathered a group of breast cancer patients, performed fine needle aspiration on them, and proceeded to use that sample and come to a conclusion on whether they are benign or malignant based on their final diagnosis. This gives us a supervised learning data set which allows us to train our model quite effectively. A matter of fact, this Wisconsin breast cancer data set is one of the most reliable data sets out there and acts as a benchmark for any medical algorithm training. But before we look 
at the actual model. Let's take a step back and understand why AI is the perfect tool for this situation. The best way to treat any medical problem is to treat it from the cause, from the root of it. But we can't really do that with cancer because we don't have time. Time means life, and the more time we waste trying to find the cause of the problem, the cancer could have already spread and the patient could have died. So when it comes to cancer, we need to do damage control first. AI is very useful because it studies correlations between data. To look at what a correlation is, let's look at this example. Let's say it's a really hot sunny day, and you think, hmm, I want some ice cream, and then you ask your friends to get ice cream, and everyone gets ice cream, and then the ice cream sales rise up. But because it's a hot day, people also decided to go take a swim to cool off, which increased the risk of drowning accidents. We know that eating ice cream doesn't make you drown. They're not caused by each other, but they're correlated to each other. If we take a random day in a year, and ice cream sales are increased, it could be because there's a new special fare, and there could have been more drowning accidents because there was an event at a beach. But when both things increase together, we know, oh, it must have been a hot sunny day. The same principle applies to the context of our model. Nuclear perimeter could increase if the cell is swollen. But when that increases and fractal dimension changes, we know that the cell probably swelled because it was malignant. We can use this principle across a range of 30 different variables to predict most accurately whether the tumor is malignant or benign. Now let's take a look, of, look at how this would actually be implemented. Each data point has a different sort of relationship with the malignancy of the cancer. Nuclear perimeter, it's suitable to use logistic regression because as you can see, it's just a line that goes up. They have either a strictly positive or strictly negative correlation, but not every variable is like that. Fractal dimension changes differently and it affects malignancy a different way, which is why we decided to use three other statistical concepts as well like support vector machine, which categorizes the variables and uses their distance from a hyperplane to map out the prediction, and random forest and gradient boosting, which use a combination of decision trees and possibilities to see what could be the actual answer. And when we put all of these models together, this is what it would look like. Fed in 80% of our data set into the model, it kept putting the data points and created a map like this. So now every time you put in the dimensions of a tumor, it will be compared with all of these data points to come to a conclusion on whether it's malignant or benign. Let's take a look at the actual model. With patient access results. This, these are the dimensions of patient access first tumor, the one on the right. As you can see, it said the malignancy probability was over 98%. So that's definitely the tumor they should have prioritized first. The results for the second tumor, the one on the left, which was a cyst. And now it's benign, with, all, with a probability of about 2% of it being malignant. So what the doctor could have done is tackled the right breast first because the left breast's mass isn't going to spread. But AI isn't that accessible to us yet. Not everyone knows about how useful of a tool AI can be. So what eventually happened to the woman is because they didn't know the left breast was benign, they just performed a mastectomy and within four months of the surgery of her breast being removed, she eventually passed away. The question that we always ask is to what extent AI can perform before human intervention is needed to correct the process, to correct any errors that AI could make. But the question that we should also be asking is to what extent can humans perform before things are overlooked and AI intervention could have made the process faster? Because when it comes to cancer, time really means life. Whether we like it or not, AI is the future in medicine and every other industry as well. When we are prepared to accept its capabilities and understand its limitations, then we will be the future. 
We envision a future where a nurse in a rural area can perform the fine needle aspiration, run the numerical data through our learning model, and get a second opinion almost instantly. Our project isn't supposed to replace doctors or pathologists, we are just giving them a second pair of eyes that has been trained by millions of pixels and thousands of hours to hopefully catch what could be missed and save what should be saved. With that, thank you very much.